Hello, everybody. I believe we're all doing good. I want to say thank you to NIBAP for giving me this privilege and opportunity to present for this month's um, webinar. Yeah, so we go straight to our topic of discussion, are animals coping with urbanization? And we want to see how that is playing out in birds, in vocal communication in birds, all right? So basically, um, urban, urbanization has been on the increase right from um, the civilization of man, uh, but not until the, uh, the start of the 20th, 21st century, the population in urban areas were actually lower than the population in rural area on a global view, all right? So, um, around the, between 2000 and 2010, the population of people in urban area um, overtook the population of people in uh, rural areas. And that has a serious negative uh, consequence on biodiversity. What that means is that several habitats are being transformed into human habitations, all right? And um, consequently, organisms are being displaced from their natural um, habitat or natural abode, all right? So basically in the urban environment, several things uh, present challenge to um, biodiversity. Of course, we know the first thing that happens when a place is urbanized is loss of habitat, right, to biodiversity. Um, so some decide to stay and some decide to leave. Those that stay are called urban um, adapters and those that leave are called urban avoiders. So for the urban adapters, they have to adapt, they have to develop means to navigate around the challenges presented by the urban environment, all right? So basically in the urban environment, several challenges are observable, all right, to communication in um, organism, in the urban environment, not just communication, but a holistic view of the human components of the urban area that present challenge to existence of biodiversity. You could have artificial, artificial light at night, all right? You have traffic, you know, noise levels generated by heavy traffics, you could have several, um, you know, nutrients that is circulating around because of human dumping of uh, chemicals and all that in the urban environment. You know, you could have uh, uh, in an environment that foster um, transmission of diseases among biodiversity. Okay, you could also have higher density of building that provide or generate uh, or present reverberative environment to uh, communication in animals. So acoustic communication is actually um, crucial to survival and reproduction of animals in several ways, okay? So the, the use communication in mate attraction to to detect prey, to avoid predators, and what have you, you know? So if the communication is not well transmitted or if signals are not well transmitted, the essence of that communication will be defeated. And as we know, communication, it's, I mean, it's very, very vital to fitness and survival. So the urban environment has become a menace to some organism that are vocal. So in such a way, they would really want to put up some adaptive responses to be able to survive in the urban environment. We have seen that some beds, so basically we are looking at beds and how they respond to urban uh, components and how they are able to survive in the urban area, all right? So beds have been found to put up some responses to be able to live successfully in the urban environment. One is that they have been found to, to 
sing at higher pitch where there is a lot of noise, okay? They have always also been found to sing at um, lower pitch where there are a lot of um, um, pavements and walls and structures that could scatter and echo and reverberate their sounds, all right? So uh, it is known that lower pitch is able to propagate well in this kind of environment. They have also been found to put up some behavioral adaptation where they could maybe fly away from noisy area or perch in open area so that they will be able to, you know, transmit their signal efficiently. Okay, so they transmit their signal efficiently. We all know that the open environment, basically it is evolutionarily new to these organisms. They did not evolve with it. It is us humans that are generating a new environment that these organisms, organisms need to begin to adapt to. And such adaptation, new adaptation measure will take several things, you know, will take, will involve trade-off, give and take kind of thing. So it has to equal, culminate in a, a kind of, okay, win, win, you know, um, kind of thing for them to be able to survive and um, reproduce very well in the urban environment. Okay, so um, I'm going to play a sound for you and all right. So that is the sound of a northern gray headed sparrow. You could hear it Q, Q, and you could see how the sounds are arranged in space. All right, they are arranged in space. This picture of a sound is called a spectrogram. Some people call it a sonogram. And uh, basically what it shows, it presents a pictorial form of the sound in frequency and time. Okay, there are there, there is also another form that you could present in a wave form, but this is much more understandable to even uh, a layman if we're able to explain it well. So when you hear a bird call, you record a bird and you bring it to a software that can generate this um, spectrogram, you will be able to analyze some fine structure and aspects of the sound that is being produced. So we heard the sound as it was produced by the Northern Gray-Headed spar gray Sparrow. Ah, uh, the spectrogram below the first, it's an enlarged form of that spectrogram that is detailing some of the structural, you know, uh, conformity of the sound. Now, you could see that the sound falls within a range of frequency and it's being pointed, you know, from each end by an arrow. The one up is the lower, I mean, higher limit of the sound. The one pointing upwards from below points to the lower limit of the sound. And this one single note of a, of, of a bed sound is called a sound element. Okay, so each of these elements are put together to produce phrase, phrase put together to produce song, and what have you. That's, I mean, another topic for discussion, okay? So basically, the sound, okay, I've told you about the lower upper frequency and the lower free, I mean, and the lower limit. So the upper limit is called maximum frequency. We're going to be using that a lot in this presentation. And the lower limit is called... Um, minimum frequency. The, the difference between the upper limit and the lower limit is called frequency range. And along the horizontal axis, which is the time axis, you will see that the single note occupies a time uh, duration, all right? So from the beginning of the sound to the end of the sound is called duration of the sound. And the distance between each note, you know, from one note to the other is called an interval, all right, note interval. So basically these are the fine structures we're going to be examining 
and how it is affected by organization. Uh, I think I should give you a background now so that you, you understand very well as we go further. This, there are two hypotheses guiding um, the response of vocal adjustments of species to urban components, or not just urban components, to habitat structure. All right, so there is what is called the acoustic niche hypothesis that explains that several beds or several organisms call, or let's say several beds now, let's use beds as we are talking about beds. Several beds calling at the same time will be calling at different frequencies, all right, so that they will be able to pass their signal at the same time, even if they are calling at the same time, all right, to, I mean, pass their signal to different um, receivers without being overlapped. So if you are talking and I am talking, our talks will not overlap each other because we are targeting different individuals to sing and our frequencies are on different levels. So there is no overlap in that case. So it's a hypothesis that explains why even, you know, when birds call in the morning, it's a, I mean, a scenario called dawn chorus, several birds calling at the same time, and they seem not to be confused by somebody's own call, you know? So it's called acoustic niche hypothesis, where each bird finds its note or song in a particular frequency that is not overlapped by another frequency. So basically, when there is a lot of noise generated, when, it, when a bird is calling at a time, every other sound around it is considered a noise for us, all right? So what happens is that, I mean, the, the, the important thing there is that let those other sounds not overlap to mask the sound that is being produced by this individual. So when the sound overlaps this, the, the, the sound that is produced by the individual, it is called masking. It has a masking effect. And that is what exactly um, um, noise does to bird sounds or to any other, any other vocalizing organism. When there's a lot of noise, the noise is able to, to mask, all right, to mask the, the call or the signal that is being um, transmitted via that vocalization. There is also, so it has been um, seen that where there is a lot of noise, birds decide to, to, to sing at higher pitches, okay? So that they can avoid the masking effect of the noise. And also basically the effect of noise is mostly felt at the lower limit of their sound. Yeah, because noise is actually a low frequency background noise. So anything that is around that frequency, that low frequency is being masked by noise. So birds decide to choose higher pitch so that they can avoid or evade the masking of this noise. And then the other, other one is called the acoustic um, adaptation hypothesis that explains how habitat structure affects or shapes the way birds sing, the shapes, the frequency at which bird sings. And a typical example of, uh, I mean, a typical situation to explain that is why birds in forest sing at lower pitch than birds in um, savanna area. So it has actually been documented that there is variation in the frequency of birds calling from the same, I mean, from different um, habitats. So those birds that are found in the forest area where there are a lot of, I mean, the high density of uh, trees, you know, vegetation cover leaves to, to, to scatter the sound, the birds decide to call at lower frequency. The reason is that the lower frequency call is able to navigate around these impediments as they propagate to give a um, <clears throat> signal to the receiver. So where there is a lot of density of structures that can obstruct the sound, the birds will decide to bring down their frequency. And most time, the, it is the upper limit of the sound that is being affected by these structures, 
Okay, so basically this is a background of what we're going to be looking at. So most times um, noise have been studied extensively and how it affects um, communication in organism. I mean, yeah, in vocalizing organisms. It has also been studied how noise has effect on the health of human being, all right? So if noise will affect human being, then definitely it's supposed to affect other organisms as well. They, it's affect their physiology and even their psychology, all right? Uh -huh. So the combination of two impediments or two challenges presented by urban physical structures so the communication of birds have not really been explored. Okay. I said earlier, noise has been extensively studied, but not with physical structures. All right. So we decided to, to, to do a research and combine and see how the combination of noise and physical structures affect birds' communication. And if there is a way they are putting up some adaptive responses to navigate around these challenges presented by the urban components. So we decide to determine the baseline levels of ambient noise, all right? That is noise, that is what we call ambient noise, background noise, environmental noise, okay, generated by humans. Now baseline levels of ambient noise and physical structures. We also wanted to determine um, the level of adjustments of the frequency of sounds produced by the birds to um, when there is um, a variation or gradient of ambient noise and physical structures. We also wanted to investigate the behavioral response of uh, these birds to these urban components when they are calling. So we chose two common species species that could be found along a gradient of um, environment, okay, gradient of land use changes, okay, gradient of land use where, where noise and physical structure can vary in levels. So common bubble and northern gray other sparrow are good species for that. They are found in the rural area, suburban area, and urban area. So we we, we didn't hesitate to pick these two. And one other reason why we chose them is that they are actually vocal species. You, 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 really, you really can't, they can't hide, they are vocal. You can attest to that by saying that one of the beds or one of the things that wake you up in the morning is one of these beds. I probably think you know which one it is now, the common bubble. It's always the one that you wake you up in the morning, very early in the morning. You hear Q, 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 Q. You know, Dr. Quick, as it's always called. Okay, so what did we do? We sampled um, along a rural urban gradient. And I have given the um, justification for choosing this gradient from the rural area to the urban, uh, suburban area to the urban area we expect a variation, okay, of these urban components so that we could relate that to the vocalization frequencies of birds and their behavior. You know, if there is an increase in background noise, how do the birds, you know, um, behave? If there is an increase in um, urban physical structure, how do they behave, all right? And as you have, as you're seeing, we did this study in JOS. Okay, so what exactly did we do? We recorded beds along tracks, you know, major and um, minor tracks around settlements. We also determined the noise level in each of these settlements where we recorded our beds. And uh, we did that by using a noise uh, level meter. Okay, we also determined the level of physical structures, that is urban reverberating um, structures, that is pavements, walls, and all that. So we determine that by running a supervised image classification. And uh, that was actually done around each point where we recorded our beds. 
so that we can relate to what exactly is happening when they vocalize around these uh, physical structures. So how did it go? Now I have already explained to you these sound uh, elements and the lower frequency and high frequency um, limits. Okay, so what we did, we extracted the high, the lower limit of the frequency, we extracted the higher frequency, we extracted um, the time. And yeah, so we extracted all these. Basically it comes out in a tabular form where you can export to Excel to see, and they all come out as values, all right? So we run an analysis, we use Raven Pro to do the sound analysis. We use the um, R for our statistical analysis. So what did we find? We found that according to our objective one, where we wanted to determine baseline uh, levels of uh, ambient noise and physical structures, we found that ambient noise actually significantly was increasing as we moved from urban, I mean, rural area to the urban area. So, and um, we also found that physical structures significantly increased along this gradient of settlement. Okay. So it, I believe it's not um, something of surprise to see that ambient noise is increasing, you know, from rural area to urban area. We of course know that the population of rural area is not comparable to suburban nor to urban area. Okay, and the more population in a place, the need for buildings. All right, so there is the, there is the need for building, you know, resulting in high building density. There is also the need for you know people getting car, riding around, driving around to workplaces, commercial activities and all that. So there's a lot of traffic building up when you progress from the rural area to the urban area. And basically the components of urban noise where traffic, okay, you have traffic from car zones, car homes, you know, from construction, from um, AC, from generators, all these things are, you know, contributes to the level of noise that you find or you were able to record. And um, basically this is comparable to other studies that have found similar things that noise increased from rural area to urban area, okay? And uh, the levels are actually, you know, it's from 57, um, dB decibel to about 62.4 decibel were recorded for ambient noise level. While the physical structure came, I mean, the physical structure we expressed as percentage from the rural area, we saw something like um, maybe about 0.25% as the lowest and then to almost 100% in an urban area. Okay, so basically there is that high variation and significant variation along uh, the urban, um, rural urban gradient. So what did we find when it comes to vocal adjustments of beds to our urban components? You remember we have two bed species, the P. babatus common bobo and the P. gracious northern gray-headed sparrow. We decided to test the minimum frequency of each of our beds, you know, and relate them to the level of ambient noise. We found out that common bobo increased its minimum frequency as noise level increased. But um, the P. grisus, I mean, Northern Grey Headed Sparrow did not seem to do the same as we saw with the Northern I mean, with the common bobo. So what this means is that common bubble decides to sing at a higher pitch when noise level is increased, okay? When there is high noise level, they sing at a higher pitch. Um, and from my previous explanation, you should know exactly what is playing out here. Noise plays a masking role to these birds, 
okay? And um, what they would do to avoid the masking is to sing at a higher pitch. Singing at a higher pitch means your frequency is above the frequency of the noise. So you don't have to be disturbed. So that is what we observed here. And if you compare the two bird species, common bubu is singing at a higher pitch, but Northern gray headed sparrow seems not to be disturbed by the noise around it. And um, why, well, we know that posed another question for us to investigate. And we, we actually investigated and found that, okay, oh, naturally the vocalization of common bubu is lower than the vocalization of Northern gray headed sparrow. Okay, so basically, and um, what is playing out here is when your call is already high above the level of masking, you do not need to adjust anything. And that is what is playing out with Northern Grey Headed Sparrow here. Common Bubu's vocalization is low in the range of ambient noise, which can be masked. So it is increasing it so that it will not be masked. But Northern Grey Headed Sparrow, it's already having a natural high um, um, vocalization frequency. So it doesn't need to adjust its minimum frequency at all because it is not maxed in any way. Okay, it's not maxed in any way. And basically that is what is playing out here. So we also decided to test their maximum frequency, you know, against the physical structure. One thing you should know is that we have already established that noise affects minimum frequency while physical structure affects maximum frequency. And um, from the previous um, um, slide I showed, we also played around to test if um, noise will have any effect on maximum frequency, but we didn't find any evidence for that. And that confirms what is already in literature. So we didn't bother to talk about that. All we know or we wanted to see is, okay, how is noise affecting minimum frequency? How is uh, uh, physical structure affecting um, maximum frequency? And to our surprise, what we found was that Northern Grey Headed Sparrow is reducing, decreasing its maximum frequency, implying that it is singing at a lower pitch, okay? But for common bubble, that is not happening. And that posed another question. Again, it all boils down to the frequency, all right, of the sound of each of these beds. And um, the acoustic, the, the, the frequency or the acoustic as niche they occupy in the acoustic space affects the way they um, respond to this. So the max since the natural frequency of Northern Grey Headed Sparrow is already high, the maximum frequency will definitely be high. And since physical structure affects and scatters maximum frequency, what the Northern Grey Headed Sparrow is doing is is decreasing its maximum frequency, singing at a lower pitch, so that it can navigate its call around to 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 a kind of send um, uh, a signal i mean a sound that is intact in signal so we already found out that um, um lower frequency signals are able to propagate well navigate around structures so they don't scatter a lot so it can reach the receiver intact and that is why uh, northern gray headed sparrow it's reducing it's a maximum frequency. In other words, singing at a lower pitch, okay? So we have found out that this is what is happening. So what other thing we decided to find out was, okay, if common bubu is singing at a higher pitch, does that mean it puts up any behavioral no response where there is a lot of uh, noise? And if come, I mean, and if um, Northern Grey Headed Sparrow, it's actually reducing its frequency and singing at a lower pitch. Does that mean when there is a lot of uh, physical structure, does it put up any behavioral me uh, measure 
to navigate around this um, challenge. So we decided for the Northern Grey Headed Sparrow, we, did, we decided to check if the bed is affected by physical structures. That is the higher the level of physical structures, the lower the level of um, its maximum frequency. It means that if it perches away from the physical structures, um, it's going to be singing at its natural frequency, all right? Because the physical, uh, the maximum frequency will not be affected again. So we decided to measure the distance of each bed that we record from the nearest physical structure, okay? And we tested that. We found that, that the distance of the beds from the nearest physical structure, as physical structure, as the density of physical structure increased, the distance was actually decreasing, okay? This is quite um, um, opposite to what we expected. We thought that as the density of physical structures will be increasing, the distance to the nearest physical structure will also be increasing, meaning that the bears will be patching away from the physical structures, okay? Okay, so what is actually playing out here is from our field observation and from the box plots that is showing here, you could see that the bears in the urban area that they are actually choosing, I mean, patching far away from, from physical structures, okay? Even though this is not a statistically significant term. A result, but we would not undermine the biological significance, which is telling us exactly what is happening at the background, that the beds are actually patching far, far away from physical structures when um, density of physical structures is increasing. But then that is not enough to generate a result that would um, present an increase in the physical structure as, um, uh, I mean, increase in the distance as physical structure increases. Reason is the more you go towards the urban area, the more, the less the space between physical structures. So the density increases. So there is no much, you know, space between physical structures. And that is why the distance is showing to in decrease, even though we expect that it should increase. Our observation proves that the beds were actually choosing open spaces away from the physical structures. They were choosing open spaces like gardens, like uh, along the road on wires and all that. Those places were away from the physical structures. But again, because of the density of building around in the urban area, the distance they take away from the physical structure is not enough to say, to be to present that, all right, that the distance is increasing. I probably think you understand what is happening here. So we move to the next graph. We have seen that, okay, if you consider the box plot, it's showing that as physical structure is increasing, especially in the urban area, you will see that um, the bed is patching away. So we decided to compare, okay, if the bed is patching away, let's see if it will actually um, bring back its uh, vocalization to the normal, I mean, the natural frequency. We found that in the rural area, it is still decreasing its frequency in the urban area not much is um, happening here, all right? There's a flat relationship between the maximum frequency and the distance to the nearest physical structure. Um, so we can say that this is not a good result for us to conclude anything. The bird is still decreasing its minimum frequency, I mean, its maximum frequency, which shows that the choosing or patching or patching away from physical structure uh, in this scenario, it may be good to patch away from physical structure to sing, you know, to evade the disturbance of the physical structure. But again, the distance from the physical structure is not enough 
for it to begin to bring back its localization to the natural frequency. Why? Because the density of the physical structure, is, I mean, physical structures are so clustered in the urban area that it's not enough. Even if I patch away from you, okay? A typical example, if you are talking or some, yeah, if, if my sound is reflected by a wall, if I patch or draw back some few steps, there is another wall behind me. If I draw back some few steps, there's another wall behind me. So the few steps I have drawn back is not enough distance for the effect of the wall before me not to be felt. That is exactly what is happening here. But we have seen generally that if um, there are enough space for the best to patch farther away from the physical structures, we will see that they will bring back their vocalization to the natural frequency, okay? So for common bobo, we found out that, you know, for common bobo, it's actually, um, its sound is affected by noise. So, and uh, there have been an established relationship between noise level and height. So the higher the height, the lower the noise level. So we tested if truly the common bugle, its sound is being marked by noise, noise, then it should choose a higher pitch so that it can avoid or evade the masking effect of noise. And what we found in this suburban area, we found that the birds were actually choosing higher pitches. Okay, they were choosing higher pitches as noise in increased, and that satisfies our expectation. But in an urban environment, so something is happening that uh, we need to take note of. If you plot this, if you have a complete plot, I mean, one plot, you will see a kind of increase, a little increase or positive increase, or yeah, a positive uh, relationship in the patch height showing that the bed is actually, the birds are actually choosing higher pitches to avoid masking of noise. But then for the urban environment, something is happening here. Um, the, the, the pitches choose, I mean, seems to be flat in a way. I mean, the, there is no, I mean, defined relationship between pitch height and ambient noise. And I probably think I know what is happening here. The patches available in the urban environment determine which patch these birds choose, all right? In the urban environment, especially in the places that we conducted our study, they are lungus, okay? They, I mean, not lungu per se, but they are a kind of flat buildings where you will rarely see trees, okay? So it is only the patch that is available for them that they choose. Even though they are choosing higher patches, all right, seemingly choosing higher patches, the patches, again, we are not high enough to have a positive relationship with ambient noise. And that is what is happening here, exactly. So you could see that, but the thing you should note here is if you consider the suburban environment, the birds are patching higher as noise increased. And when you see their minimum frequency, this is the second uh, graph by the right, you will see that it is decreasing its minimum frequency. That makes sense, isn't it? As it increases its patch height, it decreases its minimum frequency, which tells us that, okay, as these birds choose higher patches, they definitely oh, are bringing down their minimum frequency to sing at the natural frequency that the know how to sing, all right? So there is an effect of patch height. I mean, urban, I mean, noise is affected. I mean, it's affecting patch height. So what I'm saying in essence is this. I think this is a linear relationship. A non-linear relationship would explain this better. And this is how it looks like. In the urban environment, there is the noise. I mean, patch is increasing as noise is increasing. Now you could see in the, sub, in the urban environment that the 
the best choose patch higher patches, but up to a point, they began to choose lower patches. And that explains why I said that it's only available patches that they make use of. Where these patches, I mean, patch height is beginning to decrease, there are places that are more or less like um, uh, not the main urban centers, but towards the art. I mean, when you are going out of the urban area, places like Tudunwada, places like, you know, all these places that have high population density, have high population, I mean, high density of buildings, but they are low buildings. You rarely see some trees in some, I mean, see trees in some compounds. So it is just the low buildings that they are making use of. Not that they are not deciding to choose higher pitches, but just the ones available for them to choose is what they are doing here, okay? And then if you see the relationship here, uh, in the urban, in the suburban area, as the pitch is going up, the minimum frequency is decreasing. And here in the urban area, the pitch goes up and comes down, pitch height. And here in the maximum minimum frequency, the pitch comes down and begins to go up. This is exactly what is expected, all right, in the pitch height. They choose higher pitches and then sing lower, okay? So that because if they are up there, even if they sing lower, they will not be maxed by ambient noise. So I probably think this, and I mean, this is a really interesting result. And one thing that we just need to know is that for this objective three, it's um, it's a pilot that we conducted for it. It's definitely going to be ticking on and we'll collect a lot of data to test exactly what um, it's happening here, all right? So basically, this is how these birds are responding to urban area. I mean, to urban uh, components. So what should we care about? Now, this brings us to the question whether beds are coping with urbanization, okay? You should know that the first thing that happens when uh, an area is urbanized is that the beds avoid the place, habitat is lost, and the only ones that remain are the ones that can navigate around to survive in the place. So well, we could answer that the bears are coping with urbanization, but just in some ways, there is need to consider trade-off, okay? To consider trade-off. Now, the increase singing at higher pitch and singing at lower pitch is not the natural frequency of vocalization of these birds. We already found that common bubu sang at higher pitch when noise was noise levels were high. Why um, northern grey eider sparrow sang at lower pitch when physical structure were, was high? Okay. This definitely, they are, they are, they, the shift in their vocalization is being shaped by the level of noise. And of course, you should know that these are not natural uh, for them. It's not natural for them to, to sing higher or to sing lower. It's just circumstance, okay? And it's really have been found that the, the difference in the vocalization, that is the shifting of this vocalization frequency is being reflected in their, uh, in their, uh, I mean, in their reproductive, um, in their reproduction, okay? So there is a lot of uh, fitness consequences that is attached to adjustment of vocalization, even though they remain in the urban area and they, you know, succeed to communicate, but then, it is not the natural means of communication. They have to put up more energy. You know, singing at a higher pitch definitely means you have to sing louder, which means that you have to sing higher. You have to put more energy to do that. And singing at lower pitch definitely means you just have to adjust some kind of your physiology to be able to sing lower, which is not the natural means of your um, singing. So being that having been said, if they are not singing at their natural frequency, there is definitely 
a consequence to this. All they are doing is trying to adapt to the environment. But then that has to be at a cost, okay? If you are singing higher, you are singing louder, and it will not be melodious as you would sing naturally. Now, just, just consider this scenario. If you've watched a movie before, you or some uh, people are in an, in, in an helicopter or airplane. You know, if you've watched the war movie, I like war movies. So they are in the airplane. And if they want to communicate, they sing. I mean, they, 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 they really speak loud. Even though the next person will not hear because of the noise and the breeze, you know, that's blowing through. All right. If they keep on singing, I mean, call, I mean, talking at that frequency and that um, amplitude, definitely you know that they are going to exhaust a lot of energy. That is not their natural way of, 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 of talking. So it's the same thing that is applying to these beds here. Okay. And it has been experimentally proven that beds that sing or call in noisy territory do not call melodiously they don't they don't they don't find good pairs good mating pairs okay so their reproduction is reduced okay their reproduction is reduced already now one one current or um um one i mean recent finding about the effect of urbanization on bed vocalization was um was 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 determined around the COVID nineteen um, um, pandemic era. Okay, so a study was conducted, and people found that during the silence of the COVID nineteen pandemic, the bears were found to be singing at their natural frequency, and that natural frequency means they are, they were singing more melodiously when compared to when there was a lot of noise traffic all over, when people were moving around. So this definitely is affecting these birds, just that we do not know. They still exist, but you know they still exist in the urban environment. But we need to do a study to determine their population level. I mean, much more detailed study, their population level to see how their population varies along this rural urban gradient. There are a lot of factors playing parts here, but then we could single out the, the effect of um, noise and physical structure in this as we have done in this study. And it has a lot to do with um, affecting their fitness, okay? So it's not just um, having to know that the bears are actually calling at higher pitch or lower pitch when uh, there is noise or there is physical structure. But we should know that it really affects them, their reproduction, their immunity, and their physiology, okay? So it's a call for us to be able to advocate for you know building a wildlife-friendly environment. Even if we are taking down places, turning them into, um, urbanized area, we should be able to plan our city where beds can be accommodated. You know, one good thing I like about the Western world is they have speed limits. So there's a limit where you can go. And you know, if you are speeding, the more you are speeding, the more sound your car makes, okay? So we can find a way of planning our towns and cities where we can create bombs, set limits, you know, Put some restrictions to some things that will generate um, that will generate noise, and also set you know things that would really promote or enhance communication in beds in the urban area. Okay, so basically, that's all we have found. We have found that ambient noise and physical structures varied across landscapes significantly on the Joss Plateau. And the two best species, common bubble and northern gray-headed um, gray sparrow, adjust their vocalization. All right, in the presence in the in in the presence of varying levels of um, ambient noise and uh, physical structure, 
but this is not without consequence. Of course, we know that already. And then the direction and type of response depends on the acoustic niche each species occupies in the acoustic space. This we have seen in the different response carried out by Northern Grey Head Sparrow and Common Bull. So with this, I come to a conclusion of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for hanging around. Bye-bye.